Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Very good evening to you. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Iran risks provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation, a warning from world leaders following last night's attack on Israel. G7 leaders, including Lord Cameron, have been meeting to discuss the crisis in the Middle East. They've condemned Iran's attack and say they stand ready to take further measures. Israel says it will exact a price from Iran when the time is right, describing the Islamic Republic as the greatest threat to regional stability and world order. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger assault if Israel retaliates. However, President Biden has warned his Israeli counterpart, Benjamin Netanyahu, the US will not take part in any retaliatory strikes. And White House spokesman John Kirby says Israel must decide on the next step. We need to see what the War Cabinet decides in terms of uh, the whatever next step they want to pursue, and that's a sovereign decision, of course, that our Israeli counterparts have to make. I will just say this. President Biden, since the beginning of this conflict, has worked very hard to keep this from becoming a broader regional war. Earlier, Rishi Sunak confirmed the RAF did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles of the 300 launched overnight in what he's described as a dangerous escalation. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy is urging the government to issue sanctions against Iran's Revolutionary National Guard. This highlights once again the extreme danger of the IRGC and the Iranian Guard. Uh, we have said that we think that it should be prescribed and it is for the government to come forward with new plans to prescribe them and to deal with this issue of state actors that would behave in this appalling way that wreaks terror on a wider community. More than 120,000 people have crossed the English Channel by small boat since 2018. 219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than the same period last year. Labour's shadow immigration minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone and said Britain must strengthen its border security. Meanwhile, a cabinet minister has insisted the government's Rwanda plan is on track with flights due to take off within weeks. Health Secretary Victoria Atkins says the Home Office is ready to go, despite the trouble bill still making its way through Parliament. No airlines being named to transport asylum seekers. Rwanda's state-owned carrier has turned down a request. The Prime Minister, though, has repeatedly said the flights will take off by the spring, although no date has been set. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative has been dubbed Ranim's Law after 22-year-old Ranim Ude who was killed by her former partner 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of an emergency. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to deal with it. The knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before yesterday's attack. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. 
And a new poll ha suggests Hamza Youssef's popularity among SNP voters has fallen sharply. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7% amongst those who voted for the Scottish, Scottish National Party in 2019. His approval with the general public also dropped to levels similar to his Conservative rivals. It follows the introduction of a new hate crime law that prompted more than 7,000 complaints in its first week. We'll have more in our later bulletins, or we can get more in all of our stories right now by signing up to GB News Alerts. The QR code's on your screen. There's more information on our website. Now it's time for Free Speech Nation. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Allen, and this is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to Free Speech Nation with me, Stephen Allen, this week. And this is the show where we take a look at culture, current affairs and politics. And, of course, we have the latest from those lovable culture warriors. Uh, coming up on tonight's show, we'll be joined by the Free Speech Union, who are helping people with that pesky Scottish hate crime bill uh, by opening a free speech hotline. We'll also be joined by uh, spike journalist Joe Bartosz to help us discuss and dissect the CAS report and what it means for the future of gender health services in the UK. And, of course, my Myself and my fantastic panel will be answering questions from our wonderful studio audience. Uh, my studio guests uh, this evening, we have comedians uh, Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton. Yeah. <laughs> big fan of your work, big fan of your work. So let's get some of these questions uh, <laughs> from the audience. First, we, we look to Tim. First question from Tim. Thank you. Brexit, ah. COVID-19, oh. five prime ministers and the start of World War Three. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> what were... more do you want, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I suppose to put this in context, with Iran uh, launching hundreds of aerial drones and missiles at Israel, uh, the Israeli mi uh, military said that uh, Israel and other countries intercepted more than 300 of these cruise missiles, drones, uh, mostly outside Israeli airspace. But uh, let's turn to Paul. How, how are you feeling? How, how willing are you to sign up to a two-year phone contract right now? <laughs> well, you, you can sign up to it. You might not have to pay it all. Actually, yeah. So, uh, look, it has the potential, doesn't it? And we do get carried away with ourselves, particularly in the media, to, to hype this up and make it into World War III, because it does have the potential. Now, for me, it's about how Israel react against Iran. It's not to do with what Iran does, because Iran don't really have the capability. They, they can push it and they can keep pushing it, but ultimately it's going to become about the retaliation. Now, if it becomes tit-for-tat and this goes on for weeks, the West are going to support Israel. And by the West, I mean the US, and we're all going to follow in the background going, can we help out, please? And, and, yeah. and we're all going to go to war. But aren't world wars caused by people taking sides and joining in? And then you look at the, the, the list of, like, China, Russia... Uh, North Korea makes that list for some reason, and you yeah. think, well, no, I mean, you know... They, they do. do. I mean, they're not yeah. on our side, are they? No, that's true. But also, you kind of think, you know, a, a loud bang might help someone get a heart attack in that country, you know what I mean? Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> with that body mass. Look, it, I mean, I haven't seen myself, so maybe they have already, but it'd be interesting to see what China and Russia have to individually or collectively have to say about this, because they... They have an opportunity now, don't they, to say, well, we don't condone the attack from Iran. Because mm. the attack from Iran at the moment looks like it was targeted. They're saying it was. Maybe it was just as far as the drones could go and then they fell out of the air. I don't know. <laughs> but they were saying it was targeted and it didn't hit any uh, civilians. Although there has been a seven year old girl yeah. who has been yeah. critically injured, so uh, with life threatening injury. So it, it is very serious. It is very serious. I'm not trying to undermine it. And so, Cressida, you know, it's not World War Three yet, but then again, I suppose there was a bit before World War One where, firstly, they weren't calling it World War One, and they would have been like, well, it was just some Archduke. What's well, the worst that could happen? that's such a good point, isn't it? I mean, I'm glad you've come to me, you know, international weapons expert that I am. Um, I'm glad someone's asking me. But that's such a good point. We just don't know, do we? Uh, it's 50-50. I'm going to go down to Ladbrokes later and put yeah. tenor both ways. Um, I haven't got a clue. I really hope I get my mortgage sorted before it gets really bad, very much like your phone contract uh, situation. But, what? no, I mean, we're just tense, aren't we, trying to wait just for the next... Just take out every contract going. <laughs> uh, if we're going to end up in war, what's the, don't worry about it. Just, <laughs> just take out a contract that's five years Paul long. Paul Cox for PM. That's yeah, the kind Cox of decisive... I was thinking for Martin Lewis's job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Money saving expert. Get some contracts, there's a war on the way. Um, let's try and cheer things up with our next question from Roger. What have you got for us, Roger? Hello. 
Is Afghanistan now the real land of the free? I said cheer us up, Roger. <laughs> um, so it's a delegation of British clerics who went on a fact-finding mission to Afghanistan, promoted the country, which is run by the Taliban, as uh, one of the Britain's... and also one of the Britain's leading universities and uh, Afghan state television, they were saying this, describing it as a beautiful government and said that uh, they'd never felt such freedom. Uh, Cressida, would you feel a lot of freedom there? What is the one thing well, I notice about you? I'm very attached to my GCSEs. Um, I feel... You know, I'm always moaning... About about the feminists moaning in this country, but I think we've got a case of male privilege here, haven't no, we? Oh, I think it's women? a very different country depending on who you are. Um, I'm not in a rush to go to Afghanistan. I mean, good luck to them rebuilding. I, I hope they're having a whale of a time, but uh, I think it's very odd that we've got British people going over there and celebrating their style of government. It's not for me. Yeah, they have said that they, they think, uh, whilst prioritising things, they should prioritise the economy before women's education. What are your thoughts on what, that one? What really upsets me about that is that I I think it's right. Um, <laughs> well, I just, you know, I mean, we, we're always complaining in this country women get sent to work, we're encouraged, come on, become a CEO, don't be happy, be, be uh, economically productive, you know. But I'd like it to be my choice. I think that's really important. And to just tell women that they can't go to school uh, after senior school age is absolutely outrageous. And I, I, I can't believe we're having this conversation. And But there we are, we are. Well, I mean, to get some uh, counter on that and for the pro-Afghanistan take, Paul Cox. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because <laughs> Afghanistan hadn't been in the news much over the last 20 years, I thought I'd do some research, Steve. Oh, he's got notes. I have got notes. Apparently, their human rights uh, just recently isn't very good. This 218 extrajudicial killings, 14... Um, sorry, 144 enforced disappearances. This is last year, by the way. Over 140 cases of torture and misconduct of detainees. Now, that is just the tip of the iceberg. If you look any further into that Google research that I did, it is a quite terrible place to go by our own standards. Now, I know we're all about being, you know, uh, enjoying other people's cultures, but there are parts of other people's cultures that can stay there. <laughs> I think it can absolutely stay there. We don't have to bring it in. I think the way that they... I think particularly the way Middle Eastern countries treat women um, is poor. I understand the traditional role of women, and, I, you know, there are some, there's some huge values in that, but, you know, I do see women as equal to men. It's taken me a while, Steve, but I have finally realised that. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not too sure... I, I think they're just appeasing. They're just... I mean, what do you say when you're in their country? What do you make of Afghanistan? Yeah. You don't go, it's a mess. Have you seen their <laughs> human rights record? You say, it's brilliant. I bloody you, love it. I can't wait to get home. You better not go there now you've done that Googling. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. that will be after you. All uh, right, our next question is from Andrew. Good evening. Is it worth suing the government over climate change? Very good question. Well, someone thinks so, because there's a man who claims to have been made a climate refugee, an important phrase, I'm sure that'll come up in a moment, because uh, his home was demolished, because it risked falling into the sea. He's suing the government. His name is 70-year-old. His name's Kevin Jordan. He said that he lost everything, because it was all in the house, I imagine. Uh, sea erosion is the thing that's going on there. What do you reckon? Has he got a case? Well, the sea's always been there. Yeah. Fact one. Yeah. Fact two... The sea erodes the land, OK? Now, these things have been happening forever. The trouble the government have got is they've been... From my, from my perspective, as you know, Steve, they've been peddling fear for years now. So what they've done is they've given this guy an angle to claim on because they can't get out of this now, the government. That, for, as far as I can tell, they will 100% have to pay whatever he sues them because if they don't, they'll have to admit that climate change isn't that bad or doesn't exist in some way or isn't as imminent as they're making out. So they've painted themselves in the corner. He's, this is a clever move from him, I think. I mean, th they could come up with your first argument that coastal erosion is not the same as climate change and coastal erosion erodes the coasts. I mean, the clue's in the question at yeah. some point, isn't it, on this? <laughs> so they... Although he was promised that his house would be all right for about 100 years, and we're talking 15 yeah, years later. Yeah, but that... By an estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Well I've done my own experiment with this, because I like to eat cake, and I like to have a bath. I had cake in the bath, and after... You know, I'm in there several hours, and after a while, the cake erodes away. And I've got no cake. Now, is that climate change, or is that just... I shouldn't eat cake no, in the bath? No, that would happen in a cold bath as well, Paul. There's something else. Cold bath. Something yeah, else would happen in a cold bath. You don't Joe want Rogan. <laughs> you're getting a cold bath. Gammon. You're getting a cold bath for too long. You need that estate agent round <laughs> yeah. to revalue the size of things. Good. <laughs> <grief>. <laughs> I remember reading a novel by Ben Elton in the 90s where everybody ended up suing God, and we're not far off that now, <laughs> are we? I mean, I, <laughs> what? I just can't believe it. 
Um, no, I, I don't think it's reasonable. No. And also, I mean, can't the local government just give him another house on the quiet rather than let this get so out of hand? They've housed him, yeah, right. so he's not a climate refugee, which is a very dramatic phrase, and he now just doesn't live in the house Isn't that he previously it bought. just? If you haven't got anything going for you, and I'm not saying he didn't have a rich and fulfilling life, I don't know the man, but that's a new thing you can be, isn't it? A climate refugee. Well, he also said he missed looking out of his window at the sea, so he didn't have a lot in his life, <laughs> no. did he? <laughs> not a lot. Well, we don't beach. like a sea view. I mean, I'm just looking for something that's got some natural life. Light. You know, that would be enough for me. <laughs> Keep dreaming at your, your face, trying to afford one of those. Um, so, our final question for the moment comes from Mike. What have you got for us, Mike? Hi, Steve. Have the public had enough of horse racing? Have the public had enough of horse racing? Well, Animal Rising, which is an animal rights group that staged a high profile attempt to stop the Grand National last year, said that they weren't turning up to this year's one. Um, Cressida, with a name like that, surely you love horses. <laughs> It feels like you very, should. Very unfair. I'm a, I'm a dog person. Um, you can't ride I... a dog in the Grand National. That's <laughs> even worse. You haven't even tried. Um, <laughs> look, I think this is a remarkably sensible story. They've made their big point last year. A year's gone by. It turns out the public aren't that interested in horse racing. It's just dying a death. For whatever reason, the numbers are down. There are fewer uh, bums on seats at the races. So they've sort of won, haven't they? It's dwindling. And whether that's because everybody's at home on their devices and the whole world stopped working since COVID, I don't know. I, the Animal Rising people are sort of trying to say that it's because of their efforts. Now, I, I don't know. No. But it, no, look, the no, people's no, gavins no, having none of that. Disagrees. But people don't seem to be as interested. It's just falling out of fashion, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've never really been into horse racing. It looks pretty popular to me, still. I mean, people like to bet, don't they? No, but the numbers are down on last year. Instead yeah, of 40, in they've gone down to 34 horses. But it's a... <laughs> Gambling's a bit easier to sell, isn't it? People get addicted to gambling more than they do turning up to fancy events. Yeah, they'll gamble big, on anything. Big but, um, like, how much cake I can eat in the bath, that sort of thing. But the... But... <laughs> It's, it's already happening, isn't it? It's, a, it's like turning up as the Titanic's going down, saying, I told you it would sink. It's, it, it was already going... You know, the, the, the sport it itself was in some level of decline. Now, the more I looked into this, the more I couldn't really see the decline. The people that are into their horse racing are still into it. They certainly yeah. haven't been put off by animal rights activists at all, because... And I, and I do wonder if they, they ended up with some suspended sentences and people got in some pretty serious mm. trouble last year, and I do worry if they think it's... Worth more, it's more trouble than it's worth. I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from them. I mean, I, I wish they wouldn't disrupt everything and mm. just let people get to work and all that sort of stuff. But they have the right to protest. Do you think there's a, an issue about, you know, that protest looked like it might have not helped the situation in terms of horses then going on to be injured and dying? So it's easier to block the M25 than it is to do something at a horse race when if any, if any of the horses die after and people say, well, my horse was wound up because of that protest. That's such a good point, Steve. You're meant to love animals. That did happen last yeah. year. And as a result, you know, it, that, that wasn't the narrative. Wasn't it? I, I imagine that had to work very hard. You know, the, the animal rights activists killed the horse was not the headline <laughs> that they, they were expecting the next it day. It would have stopped the race if they did it enough. But they, not I, I in mean, the I way they're after. They should, we should ride... It, no, just top, off the top of my head, so it's going to be good. Uh -oh. We should ride activists round Aintree. <laughs> You can't. Tweet that and see what you get. Um, Mike, Mike, your thought on this? Are you into uh, horses? It's, it's still... Mike? I'm not into horses at all, no. Um, it's still very popular. Yeah, but it's, it's still popular. It is declining a bit. But it's it's still... like trying to ban smoking right now when it's on the way out, because uh, that's going particularly well. All right, thank you for that. Well, next on Free Speech Nation, the CAS report was heavily critical of the NHS's approach to gender-confused children. We'll be joined by Joe Partosh from Spiked to discuss the findings and the consequences. <laughs> Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of a sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke. And there is... Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale... Uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes? Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, 
Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of companies fixing things that weren't broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. In 2020, the NHS commissioned Dr Hilary Cass, a leading paediatrician, to review its gender services for children and young people. It's now been released and the ramifications could be huge. I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by Joe Partosh uh, from Spiked Online to discuss the findings. So, let's get stuck into it. What are your take, what's your take from the impact that you think it will have? So I think it's, it's great that the, the research has been done and that this report's been published, but ultimately she, she's basically said what, what any thinking person ought to have known, that it was a really, really bad idea to give mentally confused kids experimental drugs, which is what puberty blockers are. So, um, so whilst I think it's absolutely brilliant that the research has been done, I think it's um, kind of, you know, a little bit late and um, it's almost something that had gender ideology not embedded itself within the NHS and within practices, it wouldn't have been necessary at all. I suppose, given that effectively what you're saying is people should have realised this anyway. Yes. People clearly weren't realising this, so maybe do you think the presence of the report will have an impact that might actually move the debate and convince minds? Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I interviewed um, uh, Susan Evans uh, four years ago. Now, she blew the whistle in uh, 2004 about what was happening at the Tavistock. I mean, these, these concerns are not new about the affirmative approach that was pushed by lobby groups like mermaids, like gendered intelligence. So, you know, so we have known for a long time. Mm. Um, but the tenor of the debate has been such, it's been very, very difficult just to state basic biological truths, such as you can't change sex. Um, so, by way of an example, um, in 2019, I was at an event that was organised by campaigners Kelly J. Keane and Venice Allen at the House of Lords. And there was one MP there, and that was um, David Davies, TC Davies from Monmouth. Um, every other MP had been told that it would impact upon their career if they went to the event to discuss the impact of puberty blockers and what was going on at the Tavistock. So, you know, there has been a concerted effort to shut down debate on this, mm. and it's been driven by lobby groups. And I'm afraid to say those lobby groups have still got influence in the NHS. The uh, report itself speaks of the uh, toxicity of the debate, uh, but actually says that there's blame to be doled out on both sides. What are your feelings to that? Irritated, to be honest. Um, 
So I understand why she had to word it in such a sort of um, placatory way. I mean, it almost reads like a bloody hostage note. You know, you can tell that she feels like she's on enemy territory. I mean, it opens with a, a line that this is not to un invalidate the identities of trans people. Well, nobody ever said it was. It's not about that. It's about protecting children from making irreversible decisions. So on the one hand, you've had people branded as toxic who have just simply wanted to open up a discussion, open up a debate, and make sure that the evidence is there before we start effectively sterilising children. And on the other side, you've had very, very angry trans activists who have based their identities on this concept of the transgender child, and so have a real sort of personal vested interest in, um, in suppressing debate. I thought I thought we'd be more hopeful. I thought speaking to you today, <laughs> you'd have more of a hopeful tone from this. But it's like the more we dig down, I, I don't sense it in you. I, I, I am. I mean, you know, it's vindicated the whistleblowers. But at the same time, you know, Polly Carmichael, she's on the books for um, GOSH in uh, the Great Ormond Street Hospital. And they're going to be providing new gender services. Now, you know, I, I think really her head should be on a bloody spike for what she's allowed to happen. Similarly, James Palmer, who um, oversaw, he's the medical director who oversaw um, specialist commissioning services. So, you know, these people knew what was happening and they've kept their jobs. And you've had whistleblowers who have been pushed out, um, who have been trying to raise the alarm about this for a very long time. So I am hopeful, but at the same time, when you look at, for example, the Indigo Center, which is a new center that um, has been set up, set up in 2020, and that's in Manchester. Now, the, the people on the, the clinicians, um, on, on the sort of senior, most senior clinician, clinicians within that institution um, are also members of WPATH, so that's a, a widely discredited um, international lobby group, essentially. Um, they've worked with, they, they celebrate the fact they work with mermaids, and they call themselves trans and non-binary led. Now, that's a political stance, that's not a medical stance. So we are, we are still, we know we've got a lot of work to do to root this out of the NHS. So I saw someone discussing the fact that the, the language might not be what you wanted to hear, in a sense. No. It's not the, the, the vindication that you wanted. But what it is, is language that's hard to accuse of being transphobic, which actually would have shut this down, which definitely would have meant that nothing would have come from this. Anyone who didn't like the results would have simply accused it of being some turf paper or whatever the phrase they would have used <laughs> online. Um, so maybe there is more hope in that, that actually, if the core... A uh, summary is effectively saying, oh, you need evidence to do medical things. If it's just boiled that down to that, do you think that's an argument that you could sell to people? Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, there's probably a bit of, you know, personal irritation, <laughs> yeah. which has is, which is crept in. But, but, yeah, I think, you know, when you strip aside this sort of um, very conciliatory language towards the trans activists, who are furious anyway, because they're always going to be, when you strip that aside, I think actually the recommendation she's made... So, for example... Um, making sure that there's a bridge service between the ages of 18 and 25 so that people aren't just shunted into adult services without the proper support. Things like that are really important and they will make a difference. So actually, I think the, the recommendations are brilliant. I just find the framing is particularly irritating. Right, but, but personally irritating yes. rather than the <laughs> yeah, concept. If I'm honest, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so with the way that the recommendations uh, are then laid out, do you think there's a chance that they'll be listened to? Well, there's a, there are protests being organised. Um, sort of on the outside of the NHS. And as I say, there was still a lot of activists within the NHS. I think it's very helpful that it came out before the parties released their manifestos. So, you know, we've had Wes Streeting um, sort of had a bit of a turnaround um, and has said that he's... Um, He's going to... It was a big 180, wasn't it? It yeah, was, was such a 180. Was. I think uh, Keir Starman might sue for breach of copyright. <laughs> well, yeah. And similarly, um, who's the other one? Um, Gillian Keegan, obviously, you know, Tory, all the rest of it. But a few years ago, she was saying trans women are women, and now she's, you know, writing uh, opinion pieces of complaining about cancel culture. So, you know, it's things have changed, and that's brilliant. But at the same time, I would quite like to see some heads roll. Right. If this report doesn't bring about the change you'd like to see, what could happen next? I think we need an inquiry into how the hell um, sort of medically unqualified lobby groups were allowed, like mermaids, were allowed to influence policy. I think that's absolutely vital. So they promoted things that were repeated in Parliament by, you know, well, John Nicholson, amongst other MPs. Um, for example, that children were um, at risk of committing suicide if they weren't affirmed in their cross-sex identities. Now, that's a despicable thing to say. Um, and that, you know, obviously terrified parents into into allowing their children to, um, to take dangerous experimental drugs. So I think this is so serious that absolutely we need to have a proper investigation into how the hell this happened and to make sure that it doesn't ever happen again. OK, and then we'll book you in for a few years' time to come and talk about how nothing's <laughs> happened. Joe, thank you very much. That's Joe Barker. <laughs>
on Spike Online. Well, next on Free Speech Nation, we'll be taking more questions from our lovely audience. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So there has been plenty of showers around in the north, all thanks to an area of low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK at the moment, but it will slowly move its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of Monday. Higher pressure does stay close by towards the south and west for a time, bringing some clear skies through the Sunday evening. But those showers in the north and west slowly push their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning, turning particularly heavy across northern parts of England and we could even see some snow across the high ground of Scotland and it will be a chilly night here temperatures dropping into the low single figures and even in the south around seven or eight degrees. Monday starts a bit chilly but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning leaving a drier day there will be some sunshine around but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland and it'll be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd one or two showers around across northern and western parts and perhaps a few bubbling up across eastern parts of England. But there should be plenty of sunshine around. However, temperatures still close to average. Still a few showers around on Wednesday and Thursday, but there are hints of something more settled later in the week and temperatures returning closer to average. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back. Later in the show, I'll be turning into an agony uncle with the help of my panel, Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton, to help you deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. So you can message us at gbnews.com forward slash your say, and we will help you deal with your issues and get to the bottom of whatever you need getting to the bottom of. It's a bad <laughs> phrase for the, some of the things you send in. That should not be the phrase. Should it? Uh, but first, let's get some more audience questions. Uh, let's have a look. We go to uh, Kelvin for the next one. <coughs> Yep. Are there too many biopics about celebrities? And if you could make a biopic, who would it be about? Interesting. I suppose we could talk about that to the moment because you've got the Amy Winehouse one and her best friend has said that uh, the singer would be fuming if she saw it. Well, you would be because the way that it ends, I imagine. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't... I mean, it's, it's not had good reviews, Paul. Or do you think no, there are no, too no, many of these? Well, well, I think this sort of thing has been said before, obviously, but there's no case in English law where you, you can copyright a life. So you, you don't own the rights to your own life. You know, when someone's passed away, you can't copyright that trade market or make it intellectual property in any way. So people have artistic licence to write and produce, 
you know, movies and documentaries in whatever way they see fit. And, hope, and the hope is that they do it in a sensitive way. But I've not seen it. It came out on Friday. But my understanding of reading about it this afternoon is that it's done in a kind of glossy way and, that, you know, we don't really get to see the essence of Amy Winehouse, who was the genius, you know, of that period in terms of songwriting and performance. And it's just a shame what happened to her. And it, w it would have been a great opportunity now... 13 years later, I think, to have maybe written something a bit more gritty so, yeah. we, so we understood the real story. Your thoughts on this, Cressida? Well, she's untouchable, isn't she? I was a massive fan. She was a tiny bit older than me and she was such a hero. And every mistake and every bad thing I ever did, she'd done, like, a hundred times harder and yeah. faster. And, and when she died, I thought, how are we going to go through old age without you, Amy? Um, and the, the idea that you... I mean, she's... Just watch her. There's so much footage of her. I haven't watched any of the stuff... Because uh, there was another film, wasn't there, years ago, called Amy. And I just thought, do you know what? That's just going to wind me up. I don't want to see it. Okay. Um, do you know that in this one, they, they get the, the person playing Amy Winehouse to sing rather than use... Yeah. Playing the Queen one, at least had the sense of using... Odd Madrid decision, but to me the whole thing's odd. Um, but, you know, I guess it's not for me. I don't know who it is for. If you just want to write a kind of swashbuckling life story about an amazing pop star, she's the right person. Yeah. But, and uh, so the know. second part of the question was if you could make a biopic about someone, who would it be? Paul Cox, obviously. Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. <laughs> it's a great I mean, sure, answer, Chris. Sure Imagine my life yeah. story. It's mainly just baths and cake. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think it wouldn't be long, but you could put it on the old network Vine. <laughs> yeah. Who would you make one about? Ah, uh, I'd, I'd be great to see um, Andrew Doyle. Do you think? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Please keep booking me. <laughs> I think I'd go for Jason Statham because that way you could see how all of his films are the same. <laughs> yeah. Non-stop. I'm an odd bloke and I hit people. <laughs> and that's it. All yeah. the films. He's Make good looking money. as well, Steve. Well, yeah, He's, he really makes a bald head work, some of his comments. <laughs> um, our next question is from Abdi. What do you got for us? Uh, hello, another bald head. <laughs> I thought it was Jason Statham for a minute there. You look yeah. so uh, Is being dead a reason to be sacked? <laughs> <laughs> it's a solid question. Reform UK said it's mortified, which is such a weird word to pick. <laughs> <laughs> After it's, uh, it's uh, uh, sacking a general election candidate, who was deceased, which seems like a good thing. They were complaining that he hadn't been in touch, which unless, you know, unless you are turning up with a Ouija board, it feels like you've got to do half the work if they're dead. Um, what do you think of this story? What does it, well, what does it, it did make, make me reform? laugh a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my dad was self-employed all his uh, working life and there was an occasion when his business partner rang an old client to see if they wanted some more uh, business and, and the chap had died. And when he got off the phone, the joke is that dad said, well, that's no excuse, is it? <laughs> um, so maybe think of that. What do I think? I mean, they did their best, didn't they? They sent him all the appropriate emails. Uh, nobody informed them. I mean, it's just an honest mistake, isn't it? It's a massively embarrassing, though, isn't it? Surely you should check to see yes, if you can do it to have a pulse. I, I'm, not, I'm not a political expert, but that's the bit. Well, I think people who aren't very keen on reform are having a field day with this, aren't they? They're going to have a lovely time and enjoy it um, enormously. But it's... Yeah, I suppose that's true. Other parties might have oh, candidates you know... that die and they just move them to the House of Lords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where they sit dead for years yeah. and, by the looks of it. But, I mean, it could happen, couldn't it? But it's a candidate. A candidate. A candidate is someone who is chosen to do a job on behalf of the party. So the first thing to check is, are they alive? <laughs> I would say. You know, otherwise, I mean, anyone can do it. Mirror from under the, the nose. From the, from the mirror under the nose. <laughs> what does that do? So you can see that they're still breathing. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, no other, I mean, you're a scientist, but there must be other ways of checking. <laughs> Probably not. But... But he was alive to start with, wasn't he? He was he alive, was alive when, he, when he decided he wanted Imagine to be a candidate. Well, th that the... would be a, a very different story. Um... Fair enough. Let's uh, crack on to the next question. Chris, do we have a, a question from Chris? Hi, yeah. Um, should footballers stop having kids? <laughs> um, wow, seems seems harsh. But <laughs> yeah. this is uh, Jamie Carragher who tells footballers in their 20s, including his own son, therefore, not to have children for the sake of having too many distractions in their uh, yeah. career. Paul? What's your take on this? When, when did you have progeny? Uh, uh, does that mean children? I, hope, I don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> name is... I was 29 when my daughter was born, just short of my 30th birthday, and I don't... At that point, I was a project manager. So I don't think I was saving myself in my 20s for my career. <laughs> it didn't make any difference if I did, to be honest, because then I became a clown. So, um, 
Uh, it's an interesting one because it, if you look at the economics of it, if you're, a, if you're a Premier League footballer, then you can afford to have all sorts of help with your children because you're getting paid millions and millions of pounds a year. I understand what he's saying. If you actually... I've read the article in full because it seemed... It, 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 you know, it, I wanted to understand the nuance of it. And he's, he's basically saying he himself was kind of glad that he had children young because he meant he could share some of his playing career with his son and his daughter, and his son has now become a professional footballer. However, there is something to be said of putting your... You know, if you are doing something like that where your career is your life as well, that you're putting that first. I'm not sure. I don't think there's a right and wrong for that. And I'm not sure Jamie Carragher thought there should be a right and wrong. He just sort of said, look, if I, if I was in my 20s now and I was earning all that money, I would just concentrate on my career. Yeah. There are other things I should concentrate on too, you know, like just playing football and <laughs> yeah. not going to nightclubs and sniffing, like... Stuff. Yeah, which having kids might put you off that, I suppose. Um, and I remember watching the Beckham documentary and there was a bit where they just had the first kid and he has to fly off and do some international thing. It is an extra pressure. Yeah, I love the Beckham documentary. Um, Jamie Carragher, I mean, if there's one thing we need, isn't it, it's to stop young men being desperate to have babies all over the place. This just wound me up. <laughs> do we need another person saying, you know, kids are quite hard work? Is he not aware most people aren't having kids? We're having this problem with, with the birth rate declining. And yeah, then... but, yeah, but if... Look, this is going to be the harsh thing. If we don't have as many offspring of footballers, have we lost a cure for cancer? <laughs> Um, is that a thing you can say? That's not the point. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wayne Rooney. But it's not. It, it's not other footballers <laughs> reading this, is it? It's all of us. Yeah. His... But uh, the the advice is more appropriate to a footballer because you can basically play in your twenties. You don't do much in your thirties. You don't do anything in your forties. Whereas if you've got another career, it's the other way around. So this is bad advice. But don't for an they know that? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? And they did say just... it on a football podcast. Oh, did he? So yeah. maybe so it's been blown up. He didn't just stand up. in the middle of the street going, no one should have kids. That's he what I heard. He didn't just say it to his son, because that's the thing, it feels <laughs> yeah. like point, doesn't it? I regret having children, son. <laughs> he gives the advice to his son. My advice is have children, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Um, our next question is from Peter. Should naval um, recruits actually be able to swim? Should Navy recruits be able to swim? Anyone seeking to join the Royal Navy will no longer need to prove that they can swim. Uh, swimming lessons will be provided, however. Um, Cressida, end of the world? It's that phrase, swimming lessons. <laughs> it's so undignified. Swimming Do you lessons. It won't terrify people if the, the soldiers well, exactly. have got their arm <laughs> I'm on, picturing on noodles ring. and I'm picturing my dad taking me when I was seven, nose clips, you know, doing your 25 <laughs> metres, getting badges. I mean, come on. It's just, it's so undignified. I, I, no, I'm not. I think they should be able to swim. I think it's ridiculous. There's a recruitment issue, though, isn't there? That's why they're doing it. They don't want to put non swimmers <laughs> off from joining the Navy. Also, isn't there this old thing that, that sailors used to not be taught? how to swim, so that if they went overboard, it was game over, quick, harsh, but... Have you heard that? No. <laughs> I think, that I think it's like, Pan or something? Yeah, it's back in, exactly, the Peter Pan, the walk the plank days. I would say that if you're in a successful Navy, swimming won't be an issue anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it, shouldn't be a, it, shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a requirement, should it? You know, I'd be que there'd be questions up front for me. Why would I? Why would I need to swim here? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm planning to get on that large metal thing and stay on it. <laughs> um, not everyone can drive the boat, can they? No one can make the engine work. You know, you don't, I mean, you know... Yeah, but the Navy doesn't... They don't have swimmers. They don't have people at the back pushing it. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're on a tugboat now. Oh, really? I thought it was but dolphin. It does seem... It's up there with, like, people in the army who can't walk or well, run or... Uh, but then again, people in the RAF don't have to be able to fly with their arms. It's not the same... No. It, OK, I don't... I mean, this is... This just turned. It's not the same... Yeah, take that you, fact. You, right, you so, It's not the same as saying people in the army need arms and legs because the That's boat does the, the swimming. <laughs> it's not because it's called the army. It's <laughs> a lot of sense. In my are, we, are we on air? <laughs> <laughs> it's it, for, it, I, it's a recruitment thing, like you say, and the the the, the point of the story is to try and wind people up about. Spending taxpayers' money. Because what the Navy are saying is, don't worry if you can't swim, we'll teach you when you get in. You know, they'll give you a woggle and Cressida's dad will be there. <laughs> a woggle is something you tie around your. Cressida looked as if I'd said something before the war. I'm test. still thinking about the boat does the swimming. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. All uh, right, next on Free Speech Nation, should J. Cole have apologised for his Kendrick Lamar diss track? Uh, that's right, Free Speech Nation getting down with the kids. <laughs> Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday.
I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you would, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So, J. Cole, who is a rapper, says he felt terrible after releasing a song aimed at fellow rapper Kendrick Lamar and vowed to pull the track off streaming services. He said, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. Uh, the past two days felt terrible, he told an audience at the uh, Dreamville Festival in North Carolina. I damn near had a relapse, he said. Uh, now, it's not quite Israel-Palestine, but it's pretty big news in the world of hip-hop. So, joining me now to discuss the ramifications is hip-hop aficionado Lynn May. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> many fans of hip-hop, especially this week, would massively disagree with me because they're all against my opinion on this. OK, so break it down Yeah, for us. so quick overview. Um, I studied hip-hop music, um, I went to the Brit School, and initially, and it's important people know this, initially hip-hop was used as a political voice when a group of people could not have an opinion, could not have the same voting rights, they were constantly barraged with hatred and racism, so they used music and hip-hop to express themselves Himself. Fast forward to now, we have like, excuse the term, but trash like Cardi B, who is not representative, in my opinion, <laughs> of what hip hop's supposed to be. I now, think worse has been said on this show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so disappointed with the way hip hop, not all hip hop, but the way hip hop is going and how it conveys a group of people. But with J. Cole, he is probably one of the first who, because they were going through this rap battle where you really, they go low in terms of they'll, they'll diss your mum, like they'll diss your family, they, they'll bring up horrendous things about you. And he was against a guy called Kendrick Lamar, who's a really good lyricist. These are two rappers that are fantastic poets and lyricists. And it was his turn to turn around and essentially diss Kendrick Lamar. And he said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do the good thing of what sits well with my soul 
and I am not going to go against you off camera, off screen. You're like my brother. And loads of hip hop artists were like, don't be a, a wuss, this is pathetic, we want to see. It's similar to, I would like it, you know when you see a boxing match? And oh, yeah. a good boxing match is not good enough. You want to see the trash talk leading up to it, don't you? <laughs> you want to see people almost getting up and fighting when they shouldn't be. And that's essentially the same sort of like uh, narrative that has come out of this hip hop battle. People want to see blood lyrically. So, and you've used that trash term again twice now. You <laughs> I know, naughty. Um, but is that, is it then therefore not genuine? It's just the way that you sell, I mean, it's not even records these days, that you keep the interest in your product, your streams, is by having a pretend fight. How many of these fights are real as well? This is the problem, because on one hand, it's even been discussed in Parliament, on one hand, the police or the government have really uh, possibly spoken about... Uh, taking away the free speech of uh, drill rappers, um, trap rappers, the ones that are really violent, whereas a lot of people say this is just entertainment. But if you look at drill, which is like a subculture of hip hop, it's so damaging. We Recently, we have seen over 50 people, drill rappers, and not just ones that think they're drill rappers in their bedrooms, ones that actually have a huge following, either in prison for long stretches or dead. So this can't be seen as entertainment anymore. But if we go to people like J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar, the argument will be said, well, they're never going to kill each other. They're conscious rappers, first of all, which is more the poetic style of hip hop. So why would you not want to see that from them? So to answer your initial question, Sometimes these arguments do get nasty and men's ego really gets in the way of it. Just, ex uh, for example, a lot of people that used to get involved in football hooligan hooliganism, sometimes it would just be a bit of a punch-up after the pub, you'd hug it out and whatever, but sometimes it used to get really violent and nasty, and the same can be said for hip-hop. Well, you've turned up on a show about free speech, so that seems the interesting angle for me, though, that surely an argument could be made that regardless of whatever the lyrics are, regardless of whatever is said in a song yeah. or a piece of entertainment, mm -hmm. the fault happens afterwards. If ever anything then goes from a piece of entertainment to a criminal court case or, you know, yeah, someone yeah. being injured, isn't someone else got the blame, not the, not the music? No, because it's actually these artists. So, uh, a long time ago, I was working with young people in Tottenham, and there was this back and forth with rappers, with dual rappers, and one of their egos got really bruised, and they got a gun, got in a car, went to shoot one of the rappers, and it hit a young girl. And she's dead now. So this is the ramification which can come about from some of these, you know, um, arguments or rap battles, but not when we're looking at J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Oftentimes, the ones like Drake, because right now Drake's going off with one with, like, Rick Ross oh, and trash. some others. I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, th those won't be damaging, but my argument is there's a lot of young people, especially, you know, <laughs> that would look at that and they will take it not just as entertainment. OK, let's bring in the free speech panel here. Paul, do you reckon we should be banning a type of music if I overboil it down to make it seem like a simple question? No, that was fascinating for me because I didn't, believe it or not, know most of that. Really? <laughs> uh, it, it kind of brings Blur and Oasis into perspective for me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but no, I don't. I mean, I, I'm sorry to disagree with you, but, but because I'm a free speech advocate, mm. I think all speech should be free now. This is what you were getting at. It's about the responsibility of people. Now, the, the, these are often, from my understanding, young men as well, full to the brim with ego and bravado, and that, that gives them a status. And if that status is damaged, they can overreact. It, it doesn't happen in any other form of art that I can think of. This is not happening in country music, is it? Well, have you ever seen uh, the um, uh, Amadeus film? <laughs> Let me sorry to interject. Let me pose a question though. You're right, it doesn't happen in any other genre. However, uh, things like heavy metal or certain types of yeah. rock music were started to promote a lot of suicidal lyrics. And, and Marilyn Manson was definitely in trouble for that. And, the, and this is the problem. It, the difference is when it comes to a certain demographic of people, let's say it starts to affect middle class white people and their children, where they're seeing more suicides online, all of a sudden, OK, free speech is OK for that demographic, but this is affecting our children. So what would you say about no, I, 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 promoting suicide to young people in rock music? That's a really good question. <laughs> you should sit there. <laughs> 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 Trash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, he's just on the button. 
Some trash. <laughs> uh, we're friends, actually. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a great question, but I don't change my stance. And mm. it's interesting you say that, because as I was talking about it, I wasn't really thinking about the demographic. Well, I know exactly what you mean, because... The, the louder voices are those middle-class white people. Mm. And despite my look, I don't consider myself uh, middle-class. I'm definitely white. But <laughs> I, I, I don't... You don't look middle-class either. <laughs> no, oh, no, what does middle-class look like? I don't see. <laughs> 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 Cressida, well, not you... me. But it... What have I done? Um... <laughs> Oh, you, I thought you. I thought you were saying Cressida. No, no, no. You're I... middle class to me. Thank you. But anyway, well, you pass the con. Well, it's the same. It's the same problem in both cases, isn't it? Who's doing the regulating? And surely it's each case on its merits, isn't it? It's you don't just ban a genre. No, you don't. I, I mean, and when that's not really crosses... what you're saying, though, is it? What you're saying is there is there is a duty of care. Yeah, I'm. I'm just saying specifically with this discussion. I'm not necessarily banning, but why is there such a lot of hatred for a man who usually would have trash-talked back mm. to stand up and say, you know, this doesn't sit well with me and I love this guy? Where everyone was just like, oh, you wimp. Like, I just think it's so damaging where we... It's good to have that alpha masculinity, but it's also good that if we, if we look at... I think his name was Cody Fisher, the semi-professional footballer who died in a club yeah. because someone stabbed him. Yeah. Now, he was stabbed because he stepped on someone's trainers. This is the level of ego we're seeing from a lot of young men who don't have any output <laughs> of being able to channel that energy, and a lot of it is stemming from cultures like football, hip-hop, these sorts of things. So I'm just saying it's refreshing to see yeah. a man yeah. who could have easily wipe the floor with his lyrics, say, I don't have to, you know? But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I almost I took this interview in the wrong direction. It's not about pointing out the areas of concern. Actually, this story is saying, look, music Balance. and art can be giving you an example of how to live a slightly better That's life. That's free speech, saying, yeah. sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry I choose not to fight back because I love you. It may look like a wimpy thing to do, but it's still free speech. You know what? I, agree. I love you, Paul. Sorry about earlier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for joining us, Lynn May. Um, thank so that's you. the end of the hour, the first uh, on the way on Free Speech Nation. Don't go anywhere because there's lots more to come between now and 9 o'clock. Stay right there and we'll keep the entertainment heading your way. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So there has been plenty of showers around in the north, all thanks to an area of low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK at the moment, but it will slowly move its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of Monday. Higher pressure does stay close by towards the south and west for a time, bringing some clear skies through the Sunday evening. But those showers in the north and west slowly push their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning, turning particularly heavy across northern parts of England. And we could even see some snow across the high ground of Scotland. And it will be a chilly night here, temperatures dropping into the low single figures and even in the south around 7 or 8 degrees. Monday starts a bit chilly, but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning, leaving a drier day. There will be some sunshine around, but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland, and it will be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south, and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd one or two showers around across northern and western parts and perhaps a few bubbling up across eastern parts of England, but there should be plenty of sunshine around. However, temperatures still close to average. Still a few showers around on Wednesday and Thursday, but there are hints of something more settled later in the week and temperatures returning closer to average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. 
Sports. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose, and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they'd promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. There's plenty more still to come on Free Speech Nation this week, but let's get the news update first with Aaron Armstrong. Very good evening to you. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Let's uh, start in the Middle East. Israel will respond to Iran's attack last night, but no final decisions have been made about how and when. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has chaired a meeting of his war cabinet. Uh, the majority agree on the need for a response to Iran's drone assault, but they're split on the scale and the timing of it. G7 leaders, including Lord Cameron, have condemned the attack. Uh, they said Iran risks provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation and they stand ready to take further measures. Tehran has warned Israel any retaliation, though, will be met with a stronger response. President Biden has told Israel the United States won't take part in retaliatory strikes against Iran and White House spokesperson John Kirby says Israel must decide on the next step. We need to see what the War Cabinet decides in terms of uh, the whatever next step they want to pursue, and that's a sovereign decision, of course, that our Israeli counterparts have to make. I will just say this. President Biden, since the beginning of this conflict, has worked very hard to keep this from becoming a broader regional war. Well, Rishi Sunak earlier revealed RAF planes based in Cyprus took part in a number of counter-drone strikes overnight. He says had Iran been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate, and he's called for calm heads to prevail. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy is urging the government to issue sanctions against Iran's Revolutionary Guard. This highlights once again the extreme danger of the IRGC and the Iranian Guard. Uh, we have said that we think that it should be prescribed and it is for the government to come forward with new plans to prescribe them and to deal with this issue of state actors that would behave in this appalling way that wreaks terror on a wider community. More than 120,000 people have crossed the English Channel by small boat since 2018. 219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than the same period last year. 
Labour shadow immigration minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone. He says Britain must strengthen its border security. A cabinet minister has insisted the government's Rwanda plan is on track with flights due to take off within weeks. Health Secretary Victoria Atkins says the Home Office is, quote, ready to go, despite the trouble bill still making its way through Parliament. No airline's been named to transport the asylum seekers after Rwanda's state-owned carrier turned down a request. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said the flights would take off by spring, although no date's been set. And the new poll suggests Hamza Yusuf's popularity has fallen sharply amongst SNP voters. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7%. His approval with the general public also dropped. It comes after the introduction of a new hate crime law that's prompted more than 7,000 complaints in its first week. Well, for the latest on our stories, you can sign up to our alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. That's it for the moment. Now back to Free Speech Nation. Back to Free Speech Nation. Let's get some more questions from this beautifully formed audience. Our first question in this section is from Barbara. Should we use our tea bags more than once? Should we use our tea bags more than once? Well, apparently skint tea drinkers are uh, hanging their bags out to dry and later renew reuse them to save cash, according to a survey. Uh, other things in the survey as well are apparently swiping ketchup sachets from restaurants. So I'm not totally against all of this. Um, Cressida, your thoughts? Well, I already shop at Lidl, so um, it's not necessary. Gone what... dip low. <laughs> yeah. No, there's nothing wrong with Lidl, Steve. I don't know. It's a bit sad, isn't it? It's not very uplifting, but times are hard. Are times that hard that you need to save the 1.6 pence per bag? You have worked it out then, Steve. Oh, of course I have, because <laughs> I like numbers more than I like people, which is... I pick the right team. There are of more numbers. Of course you do, yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I, I think the point is to remind us all that there's a cost of living crisis, isn't it? It's not that... Are you reusing tea bags? You're not, but well done, well done. <laughs> Um, no, it's not for me. Yeah, the other way to do it would be to not drink that cup of tea and stop embarrassing yourself in front of your neighbours. <laughs> it's a washing line, just no pants, just tea bags. What are you even wearing over your bits? <laughs> well, perhaps they are wearing tea bags over their bits, Steve. Now, I'd need a really... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> a loose leaf, <clears throat> at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Sean. It's, it's been said that it's fun to be frugal, and uh, I guess... Do you know what? I was having this conversation... Just this week with my friend Claire, and she... You met Claire last night. Yeah. You know she's mad. And she... <laughs> she and we, we... She tried it today. She was making a cup of tea, and she put the... She used the bag twice, and the second bag made a very bad cup of tea. Exactly. Now, one argument against that, I can't believe I even know this, is you use more than one second-phase bag. Because the first... One bag, one cup of tea. Second time you make one, get a bunch of you together. You, you don't have quite the same savings as 1.6 pence. You've but that's it science, down. Steve. Yeah, that's... But the best flavour and the best colour and everything comes out in that first few minutes. Of course it does. How long do you even stew for, Cresta? Ooh. I'm not a big tea drinker. I mean, I'm more of a coffee person. Um, not long. Just yeah. poke it with a spoon. I'm quite aggressive when I make <laughs> tea. <laughs> right. and, uh, it's like the Kama Sutra. Huh? <laughs> 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 <It's a mental laughs> all that. Um, any other money-saving tips that you live by? I'm just recovering from saying the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Money-saving tips, no. Uh, no. No. <laughs> I'm a big fan of this Nick in sachets, though. Oh, think... that's a good... Actually, yeah. yes. Steal. Great. Theft. If, Theft you steal, yeah. like, if, much, if you steal, you haven't got to pay for it. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but that is true, but do you know what I mean? If, you, if you're eating a whatever and there's a couple of... But you already have to be in a restaurant to be stealing the sachets. Just stay at home oh, and make steal, it... You just wander in. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know who I am? You don't? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. No point, Nick, and if they Fair. can identify you. Uh, our next question is from Kelvin. Should Scrabble be made easier? <laughs> That's the most passionate I've ever seen you be. Um, so, should Scrabble be made easier? Controversial changes made to, to make Scrabble easier for Generation Z have uh, been lightheartedly compared to potty training. Generation Z <laughs> probably need to do some of that as well, by the looks of it. Um, have, you, have you heard the, the new rules? No, I don't know the new rules, actually. I did read the article. But, I mean, the idea is that thing, words change anyway, don't they? So yeah. we, we... So, <laughs> yes. No, I don't me. know where you're going with this. You yeah. nodded, didn't you, to say, I'm with you so far, Paul, yeah. but I've heard all the Kate stuff and I'm a bit worried about where you're going. <laughs> but it's, you know... 
I don't have a problem with it changing. If, if it gets more people, more people involved in the game, people aren't stupider. They're just words are stupider. I think they might be. <laughs> OK, <laughs> basically, people are stupider, Steve. People are stupider. Paul Cox. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's yes, a wise man once said, let the boat do the swimming. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does provoke my inner Peter Hitchens, this thing. I think, oh, leave it alone. It's the beginning of the end, isn't it? Why does it have to get... I mean... It, it's just a bit... He no. said, Peter Hitchin said that uh, central heating was the yes, beginning Yes, he of did. The end. We talked about this last night. Did you? That's, <laughs> probably, that's probably where I got it from. I quote <laughs> it a lot. Yeah, that's what he said, because everybody... Anyway, uh, I think it's a bit soft and silly. Wasn't there always a child's version of Scrabble anyway? Yeah. So if you can't quite make it to grown-up Scrabble, just have the Fisher-Price version. I don't version. think Scrabble I... should be exclusionary. Well, at the risk of... of uh... Trying to push you back on that one. I think you've fallen for the headlines that use the word woke in this for no good reason. So if you buy Scrabble, you still get Scrabble. It's normal okay. Scrabble. No one's changed Scrabble. No. But on the back of the board, there's a different board instead of it just being blank space where there's a new version that's just a bit easier and you can do little ch word challenges. But that was written in the, story, in the t uh, Daily Mail, being like, woke, they've taken out all the words that we like. We can't even call them oh, out anymore. No, I didn't <laughs> think they'd taken out naughty words, although I wouldn't be so much... To be honest, I just assumed everyone had taken all the naughty words out of everything. Um, I thought they'd just made it easier. Well, no. Uh, I can't stand either version. So, there we go. <laughs> uh, I like numbers, not letters. Come on. Uh, <laughs> our next question has been emailed in from Jen. And uh, so, look, we've got... It says... Um, should posh people be allowed on TV? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not posh before. You know, people are emailing to complain already. I'm from Mansfield. You can't be posh if that's where you're from. Um, this would be because of uh, an interview that it was newsreader, uh, Jan, former newsreader Jan Leeming, said that she no longer gets work because of her received pronunciation. Uh, the broadcaster joked that she doesn't tick modern boxes on account of her voice and that the English language was being mangled. Ooh, let's, let's go to Cresta on this one. Have you, you strike me well, as a person who I'm hates not being funny, Steve. I think I should answer this in my proper native accent, look, because um, <laughs> it's right where I grew up, mate. Um, I don't know. Jan, come on. I think it reminds me of when comics say, oh, I can't get work because they're not hiring blah, blah, blah characteristics. It's like, maybe you should check your act first. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it seems a strange thing. I mean, we've got the lovely Jacob Rees-Mogg on this channel, and he's very posh, isn't he? We, I, I don't think they're excluded from, uh, from television. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, although technically, I think I should say not a newsreader. I better do. Oh, is that what you <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Good point. Uh, in joke. Um, yeah, in joke, but there we go. I'll get an email. So, I mean, I'm glad posh people are on TV, cos uh, I'm here. <laughs> and and uh, I wouldn't... If this was 1964... Yeah. Uh, well... Oh, we'd be all... But you have to wear the this, proper this suits. This wouldn't, this wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> um, no, it's just... I mean, this is the thing about discrimination. It works both ways, doesn't it? So if you're if you're trying if you're trying to introduce uh, people that weren't necessarily on television, you are by that, that very nature excluding the people that were. So I, it's always good. Particularly, it was always nice, wasn't it, to hear a, a, a sort of BBC accent. Mm. It, it, it reassured you, didn't it? I don't know. I had the same thing though. So growing up, growing up in Mansfield, I thought I'll never get to work in the media if I sound like that. So I lost the accent just at the time when the media was saying, no, we want authentic regional accents. <laughs> Can you put it yeah, on yeah, for us now? How does hey, it... up, it's Don Code. I'm going on. Nice. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, by the way, anyone listening in Mansfield, it's not that code. Because they, <laughs> they would have been worried. They would have gone on. Um, none of you have any idea what I'm talking about. No idea. Absolutely no I can't idea. wait to watch this back and see what the <laughs> subtitle had tried to do with that. <laughs> Steve made noises. Steve made northern noises. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I like the fact you get a better representation of... Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not against that, of course. It, it is good to see uh, more people like uh, me and Cressida represented. But why don't you sound like you should anymore, then? That's why a good you... question. I think it's mixed parentage. I've got a northern dad and a London mum, and we moved around a lot. But... Well, I'd feel like I was putting it on if I spoke like that, but that's what I heard at school and so on. Yeah. Did you speak like that at school? Like what? Like like this. Like this. Yeah. I, think, I think so. I, I've got vague memories of sort of trying it out because I wasn't a bit... No. We, like I said, we moved around a lot, but uh, what was the question? You've got to when your dad's a bank robber, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> or a uh, fight... Wait, she didn't say he was northern. Our uh, <laughs> final question is from Roger. What have you got for us, Roger? Should Harold Wilson's press secretary have kept Stum? Should Harold Wilson's press secretary have kept Stum? Mmm, interesting. Yeah. So, Joe Haynes, a former press officer and uh, confidant to the Labour Prime Minister, decided that the, the secret that Wilson had an affair needs to come out now before he dies and no one gets to pass it on. I mean, Paul, <laughs> this breaks the, the rule, isn't it? The one rule amongst men. 
that, that if you have an affair with another man, you don't mention it? The, with a woman. Uh, with a woman. Well, you don't mention affairs anyway. So... I'm not going to talk about your affairs, am I? <laughs> no, no we, we can't. There aren't any. I, oh, I, at good. this point, I was really hoping there was so we could discuss them, but there weren't any. But, no, I mean, of course you don't. Why would you? The, the, what would, what's the point now? Uh, Harold Wilson, long dead. The, the, this person, I assume, close to it, unless... That's, yeah, that's the motivation for saying that. He was saying he wants it to be on the official record, so that the actual analysis of that period of, of leadership has the full details in. Because there were accusations that he was um, a bit sly, but they got the wrong one. They thought he was having an affair with someone else. Yeah, so maybe... I mean, no. I mean, it's... Ta ta Although... Another revelation yeah. coming my way. Uh, it's two people involved in that affair, so uh, th they own the story as much as the other person, so it's up to them, really, and, and that person's dead, so it's posthumous. Well, no, both of the two people in the affair are dead, and it was the press secretary who decides... Of course, to yes, of course. The... So... Go on. I was going to say, the, this, the one positive of this Harold Wilson had an affair story is that uh, men with pipes still get some. <laughs> that's what I took away from. Do you know, I don't think I've seen a single pipe on a dating app ever, Steve. That's a, that's there you go, new USP. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It sort of sounds a bit trashy, doesn't it? And my first thought was, oh, they're selling their story. But if this person's at death's door, then no, probably not. Perhaps they genuinely feel a calling to set the record straight before it's too late. Has it changed how you think about Harold Wilson? Not really. Remotely. I assume all sorts of things went on in the dark old days before WhatsApp and leaking and all of that sort of stuff. I'm not surprised at all. And, uh, yeah, has it changed your mind of what you think Prime Ministers... Look, we all, we all have a top ten of Prime Ministers we think had an affair. Yeah. And we all know who's at the top of that. <laughs> uh, we well, all... well, but Boris had all the affairs, didn't <laughs> I didn't he? say his name. Allegedly. No, our colleague here... There's no alleged about it, is there? <laughs> and, and he doesn't mind. I'm sure he doesn't mind. He wears it like a badge. Well, I mean, that's was, the thing, isn't it? John Major that mind. minded because right. that was a shocker to everyone, wasn't it? We, we, we all lived through the nineties <laughs> thinking like he was boring, and then you find out what he got up to. <gasps> all sorts of shenanigans. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh... His, his eggs weren't uh, salmonella free by the end of it. No. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> They're free of something, Steve. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> and I suppose statistically, the least likely to have an affair would have been Liz Truss, just because the amount of time. <gasps> yeah, you'd... 49 days. You wouldn't be able to pencil it in. Imagine that if she had done that. Be that'd be a brilliant tag to the quiz question, wouldn't it? I've not read the book yet, but I'm sure it's in there <laughs> somewhere. Um, let's crack on. Then. Moving on. Uh, next on Free Speech Nation, the Free Speech Union has over 1,000 new members joined from Scotland since the hate bill crime was introduced. So they're setting up a free speech hotline. Who are you going to call? Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. There is a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. but if you go down the old camp road today... Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Tom Beckett was. Yeah, I know. There. I know, the and, boxing um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, 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 yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In that Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely true. lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back then. I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's... That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s. And yeah. So it wasn't really the kind of the choice of most, that most people would do. No, but you did. But why? I don't know, actually. I mean, I actually, I went to a grammar school and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams. And I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, ooh. No idea what to do here, really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion. And, you know, I really kind of... I, I know that I was given some really good advice, actually, by somebody that said, just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say.
So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So the Free Speech Union is launching a hotline for anyone arrested or contacted by the police uh, under Scotland's hate crime law. The group, which campaigns for freedom of speech, said it's attracted 1,000 new Scottish members in recent weeks as the row over the new law intensifies. I'm pleased to say I'm joined now by Stephen O'Grady from the Spe uh, Free Speech Union. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. C congratulations on the new members, I suppose. Um, but the reason that the, you've got these new members, slightly worrying. It is. It's very concerning. And clearly people are coming to us because they're, they're uncertain of where they stand. They're uncertain of the, the consequences of this new law and how it may affect them. And uh, we've had a lot of questions from people as well, asking how they're meant to govern their own behaviour in light of the, the, the changes and so on. So I suppose before, when we were covering this, before it actually came in on April the 1st, there were a lot of talk about how everything would be investigated and comedians would be gone after and you can yeah. some lyric might uh, trigger things. That's not the world we're living in right now, though, is it? No, and it seems curious. Um, Police Scotland seems to be departing from their own guidance on this, that um, up until the 1st of April, they had their, their long-standing hate crime national guidance in which they said that anything w should be investigated based purely on the perception of a complainant. If they perceive malice or ill will behind something that somebody has said, they said that they will record it and they will investigate it. We now hear that Hamza Youssef has been complained about thousands of times, so much so that they, they have a script for their call centre workers at Police Scotland, where they're specifically told that there is no ill will or malice behind things that Hamza Youssef has been saying, so they can switch the complaints off. So there's no consistency in the way in which they're approaching yeah. it, and uh, it's, it's all... What they are delivering is very different to what they've promised. So the problem with that, then, is you've, you've got a law that it's very difficult to understand what it is. So as a citizen, as a law-abiding citizen, how do you work out whether you're about to break that law or not? Well, it's incredibly difficult for people to do this, and a lot of it also, given the, the impact of perception-based reporting, the test in the law is what a reasonable person would consider, and I think most of us would consider ourselves reasonable. The question is, the reasonable person making the decision there could be Police Scotland yeah. determining whether to make an arrest. Ultimately, it would be a jury, 15 in Scotland, people picked at random from the electoral register, and I have some confidence that presented with a set of facts, a jury would likely reach the right decision. But until then, there's an entire process that people would have to go through. The, the police make a decision to arrest them. They could then, if they've said something online, they have their, their, their house searched because this is a power under the law. They can seize electronic devices, so they come out with hard drives and evidence bags for the neighbours to see, all the conclusions that people could draw from that sort of thing. If they're a journalist or, or an activist, their, their laptop that's been seized like that, it's a tool of the trade that stops them from being able to, to continue what they're doing. They may not be able to replace it while the police hold on to it for months and months. And overall, the process becomes the punishment then as well. So it's not just about the effect of the law if a prosecution is seen to fruition. It's also as we go through, and eventually people will start just inhibiting their own behaviour because they're unsure of what they're allowed to say, unsure of what they can do. And the simple solution is just to keep quiet. Yeah, I love the fact that you say we think we're uh, reasonable. So do unreasonable people. That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so Scotland's hate crime law is apparently already affecting academic freedom. And to discuss this, I'm joined now by Romina Frohar, who's written about this in The Spectator. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, what's your take on how it's impacting academic freedoms? Thank you for having me. I think it's really causing everyone to self-censor at this point. It's not just... Um, because it's not clear and we don't know uh, what we can say, we don't know what we can't say. So um, 
it's a law that uh, encourages self-censorship. Yeah, and what kind of uh, examples of this have you have you noticed? Do you know anyone in academia who's reporting this? Um, yes, like in the corners, we've been talking to each other, and um, I have colleagues who also have raised concern about this. Um, it's you know it, it it's something that people are afraid of expressing out loud, and. Um, yeah, it's a, I, well, I think that's the reason I wrote about it, because uh, we shouldn't be afraid of what we are about to say, especially when it's in academia. We have to be able to uh, freely express what we are thinking, and then that's how we learn. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you're describing a situation where you'll never be able to attack from both sides an argument with full academic rigor, because at least one of those two sides will be seen as problematic. Yes, and... Um, you know, we do presentations, um, there are, you know, uh, in any classroom, I'm sure there are discussions and um, even the lecturer even wants to present different uh, points of views. I mean, how is this possible? Anybody would be, is, it, there's a possibility that for anyone to be insulted and uh, offended. So... Mm. What all of us are going to be reported? We we spoke <laughs> uh, with Stephen about the the issue of uh, clarity. The problem is it's such an ambiguous law that it's very difficult to know if you're breaking it. Would that help you if there was a, any way of actually knowing where a defining line would be? Well, I'm personally against regulating speech, but um, okay if they want to give us some sort of direction and um, on how to write and express ourselves i mean it is still a violation of free speech you know it's it, yeah. it, it, it's very it's they, it's difficult to work with especially in academia you should you yeah, should they'd, have to they'd have to be have to know how to do it to an academic level as well which would be interesting stephen what's your thoughts on this i mean have you had anyone approach you from academia we've had some members raising concerns about in particular the uh, so-called third party reporting centers that they've set up in scotland these are um what uh, colloquially termed snitching stations where people can come in with their, their concerns about free speech and uh, we may have heard of the one in the in the Glasgow sex shop and there's one on a, a mushroom farm in the borders but more concerningly there are some of these snitching stations at Scottish universities so that means that people at these universities will know that there is an office down the corridor where if somebody takes exception to something they've said they can go in there, <coughs> drop them in and they will then be subjected to the police investigation investigation process, which, as we know, Police Scotland have said they will investigate every complaint. So that must have an incredible chilling effect on speech in universities like that. And, yeah. uh, and also uh, gets rid of the excuse of why you need to go to the sex shop. Because otherwise you'd have to nip down there to report it, but there's already one on campus. Exactly. Just exactly. ruined your weekend, I suppose. Um, so this hotline that you've set up, how's yes. that working? Well, we have uh, an arrangement in place with uh, Levy and McRae, who are a, a leading Scottish criminal law firm. And uh, this is designed so that people who do find themselves in difficulty with the police, and that could be either an arrest or it could be, which is more common in these sorts of cases, um, an invitation to an interview under caution down at the station, they're able to call this hotline, will consider the case, assess that it is a, a legitimate free speech issue that's, that's in play here, and then uh, the lawyers will, uh, will represent them. So is there something that someone could say, something that is truly offensive, that you then wouldn't represent? <laughs> We do, as an organisation, we have a, a statement of values, basically, that um, we will defend people for um, the, exercising their right to free speech within the confines of the law, that we're not going to... The, ah, the, the problem is, <laughs> your motto right there, within the confines of the law, gets scuppered by the fact there's now a law that says you can't even say that. Well, we're, we're operating along two prongs on, on that particular one. First of all, it's our contention that if the law were properly enforced, that uh, we would be able to provide a robust defence to people, for example, gender-critical feminists or, or people expressing legitimate political views on things. What we're, what we're talking about here is uh, fascists advocating for genocide or something like that would, would fall beyond the sort of thing yeah. that we would be, be willing to represent. But at the same time, that is the law 
as it is, there's another sort of prong to the attack here, which is that we lobby to have the law changed where it, it doesn't make sense. And in cases like this, we've fought against the, the, the Hate Crime Act in Scotland. And there, there are other similar things in, in England and Wales and the, the UK wide that we campaign against. Uh, and Romina, can I ask you about the, from the point of view of academia, this uh, helpline that you could, a hotline that you could call, would that help or do you think there'd be a stigma associated with even making the call? Um, I think it's very helpful. I think it's very helpful because I'm sure that um, people, you know, will be reported. I mean, in this climate, victim who is, is encouraged, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be a victim. So, uh, especially in academia. And so, yes, I think it's very helpful. And um, when academics are reported, they can use this um, service. OK, thank you for that, Romina Froha. Um, it does make me think, I, I never want to be the one to fall down the slippery slope of saying, oh, you can't do anything these days. It's so tempting to do that. But when uh, policy comes after academia, that's worrying, isn't it? Because that's where a lot of important free thought actually happens. It is incredibly concerning. Of course, it's probably fair to, to observe as well that a lot of the thinking which underpins the sort of thing originated in academia in the first place, unfortunately, you know, with postmodernism and uh, the, the culture of grievances, microaggressions, all of that. It's based on COD scholarship that has now become a wide, widely accepted part of, of political thinking, if not broader social thinking. So it originated there. But yes, it is, it is unfortunate because we rely on our universities as the, the institutions of knowledge. It's where knowledge is passed on. It's where it's manufactured, whether, where it's furthered. And that simply can't take place outside of uh, an atmosphere of free inquiry. I'm surprised we got this far, because it always seemed that fundamentally the idea of judging something based on how the recipient of it feels can be un unplayable. It's an infinite number of emotions that someone could have. Anyone could be offended by anything. I could pretend to take offence to the next sentence you say. So surely that's no way to judge things. No. And no. yet it's, it does seem to be going further than I thought it would. Well, it is. It's the sort of idea of it's solipsism writ large, really, with, with, with people who, who think that their, their own perception, their own thoughts about the world equate to reality necessarily. And it is. It's wide open to abuse. We saw a case this weekend of an old aid pensioner in, in Scotland who was arrested. This isn't under the new hate speech law. This is under existing laws. Um, it was in the context of a long standing acrimonious neighbour dispute, but the neighbour knew that by ringing the police and saying that this person had said something hateful about her, and it was it, it, what she said is disputed, that this person would then be visited by the police and subject to the, the process there. So it's wide open to abuse, whether it be something malicious like that, or I have no doubt that there will be some people who sincerely feel hurt, and they do. If you disagree with them, they will take it not just as a, a, a normal disagreement, they will take it as a personal affront and a, a threat to their existence, but they will then use that, even in sincerity, and turn it against you, and you can be subjected to these sorts of things. It's a very unfortunate place to be. I'm sure you will get many of them as well. If I were you, I'd get to know some good lawyers. Oh, you already have. That's good news. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much for joining us, Stephen O'Brien. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, uh, next on Free Speech Nation, uh, Peter Higgs, the theoretical physicist whose name was attached to the Higgs boson, has died. We'll be looking at his life and his contribution to the world of science next. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So there has been plenty of showers around in the north, all thanks to an area of low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK at the moment, but it will slowly move its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of Monday. Higher pressure does stay close by towards the south and west for a time, bringing some clear skies through the Sunday evening. But those showers in the north and west slowly push their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning, turning particularly heavy across northern parts of England. And we could even see some snow across the high ground of Scotland. And it will be a chilly night here, temperatures dropping into the low single figures and even in the south around 7 or 8 degrees. Monday starts a bit chilly, but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning, leaving a drier day. There will be some sunshine around, but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland, and it will be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south, and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. 
Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd one or two showers around across northern and western parts and perhaps a few bubbling up across eastern parts of England. But there should be plenty of sunshine around. However, temperatures still close to average. Still a few showers around on Wednesday and Thursday, but there are hints of something more settled later in the week and temperatures returning closer to average. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So, Peter Higgs, the theoretical physicist whose name was attached to the Higgs boson, also known as the God particle, has died. I'm pleased to say that we are joined now by theoretical physicist and cosmologist Lawrence M. Krauss to discuss Peter Higgs' contribution to the world of science. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, can you explain to uh, the layperson what is a Higgs? <laughs> okay, I'll try in a few words. Uh, basically, the, the, the mechanism that he discovered one weekend uh, after a failed camping trip in Scotland, um, and he wrote a one-page paper about that was rejected, by the way, from the Physics Journal, first time it was written, uh, is that that there, there's, a, it, there's a particle and a quantum field associated with that particle, which can exist throughout all of space and change the properties of other particles that go through space. In particular, all the particles that, that make you and I up can get our mass because they go, they push through this field. At some fundamental level, they're massless. But just like when you have a car and you push it off the roadway, it's easy to push it off the roadway until you get to the mud. And when you get to the mud, it feels a lot heavier and, and harder to push. The Higgs field is a field that's throughout all of space, which, uh, which exists and certain particles interact with it more strongly and become heavier. Certain particles interact with it less strongly and get less heavy. Now, in quantum physics, for every field, there's a particle associated with it. So the idea was if Higgs's, Higgs's mechanism, we call it the Higgs mechanism, was correct, we should be able to find a particle, which we now call the Higgs particle. And unfortunately, the, the mechanism is so generic that it didn't really predict the mass of this particle. And for years and years and years, and I mean almost 40 years, People were looking for the Higgs particle, and finally, in 2012, at, at CERN in, in Geneva, finally, the particle was there and, and validated this. It's become a central part of what's called the standard model of particle physics. And I can explain that if you want in another few minutes. But I was say, if, if you want to get into the standard model, I think we need to make people pay tuition fees. Um, <laughs> okay. You can't be learning all of this for free. Come on. It's, it's not yeah, one no, of the inventions. No, maybe, that's right. Yeah, it's some not one of the discoveries, rather, that's, that's changed <laughs> life. We, we all talked about it. For some reason, it was in the news, wasn't it? It was one of those sciencey stories that got front-page yeah. coverage, whereas then we've not really heard a lot about it ever since. Well, you know, the interesting thing is it, it's, it's, it's one of those great discoveries which is at the same time kind of disappointing because what you really hope for is to be surprised. And, and the, Higgs had proposed a mechanism which could explain a lot of what we say is the standard model of particle physics. And in some sense, it, people like me had hoped it was wrong because it would mean there'd be something more to discover. And, and there still is more to discover, but having discovered the Higgs, 
it doesn't give us any real direction on what to look for next and where and, and where to go and and one keep is keep hoping at at CERN to find something else that'll tell us because the Higgs mechanism is beautiful, but the real question is why is it happened? Why does the Higgs particle exist at the mass it does? Why does it exist at the scale it does, which sets the scale of what's called the weak interaction in physics, which determines radioactivity inside of atoms? There's nothing that tells us why that happens where it happens, except that you needed it to have happen because of what we observe in nature. But so we're really looking for the next step, the deeper step that says, why is that mechanism happening? And we really don't have any, so far at CERN or anywhere else, any direct uh, empirical evidence that points us that direction. So when that happens, you get theorists sort of like sensory deprivation. They're, they begin to hallucinate and, and, and you see lots and lots of papers proposing this or that or something else all the way up to string theory. And um, it really seems to be, the... all they ever do is propose a paper that the only way you'll discover the next particle is a bigger collider. Oh, I wonder why no, they're doing that. They're after the funding, no, are they? No, no, no. You know, look, unfortunately, this is one of those questions where, on the whole, you really have no other choice but to build a big collider. But to say, having said that, people with the failure of big colliders to find anything new, there's another way in physics to try and look for these kind of exotic events, and that's to look at tabletop experiments, that, but effects that are very, very rare, because effects that happen at very high energy in physics also trickle down to our scale by producing extremely Man. small corrections to phenomena like the levels of atoms or something else. So people are looking at those kind of experiments to try and find some disagreement with what with our standard model to look for what's next. Okay, before I let you go, I just want to check because it was uh, it was known in the newspapers as the God particle. Peter Higgs didn't really like that, although maybe right now he's finding out that maybe it should have been called that. No, I don't think he's finding that out. But he no, he didn't. He was a quiet man, a gentle man, a lovely man, and he in fact he said the discovery of the Higgs particle at CERN ruined his life because he wanted peace and quiet. And certainly it was the, it was the Nobel laureate Leon Letterman who was a real joker, and I also knew. Who, who wrote a book called The God Particle. He claimed that he really wanted to call it The Goddamn Particle, but his editor had, had made him change that. I really think he just did that as a joke, because jokes were really important to him. But Peter certainly didn't like that. And he didn't like the notoriety he got among the public. He just wanted to be more or less left alone to do his thing. And he was a sweet and kind and gentle man. Ah, oh, lovely. Well, thanks for that, Lawrence M. Krauss. Um, thanks for joining us. Before we move on, I want to keep the science discussion going, obviously, because we've got a panel here. So, um, Paul, of all the quantum field theories, <laughs> when you look at quantum field theory, which is your favourite quantum field? Uh, quantum leap? Close. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Sam I mean, is this any science that any, it gets any close to your life? Yes. I have a HND in electronics engineering. So I did study some physics and mathematics, but uh, that was just mainly so I looked good in front of women. Did that work? <laughs> no. OK. <laughs> and Cressida, is this in, is this in your world? Correctly observed, Steve. No. Um, what a lovely man. Wasn't he charming, he that was, lovely scientist? Because you always think science people don't have a personality, but he was very funny. How? Ouch. <laughs> I love a bit of science. <laughs> did we not want to find out why you had a blue, a blue plastic? I did Everyone want else, to find out. you have a blue plastic cooking. Did but a physicist, that's like a you know electron oh, well, I don't know. beam has cut his thumb off or something. An electron beam. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like me now. They also act like light waves. It would be it, there's a field associated with. I've never been sitting in this chair and been so hopeful that the line doesn't drop. <laughs> <laughs> I, goodness me, uh, he had a lovely smile. That's well, what that's I took what from, you that. Away from that. Well, that's that's what we've learned a lot today, haven't we? Um, next on Free Speech Nation, me and my fellow panelists turn agony uncle and auntie as we uh, we help you out with your unfiltered dilemmas as we go through some social sensations as well, things that have gone viral this week. Britain's newsroom, weekday mornings from nine thirty. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She's just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross. 
and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hills, who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so been... times have changed drastically. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. On Mark Dolan tonight, have any lessons been learned from the Hillsborough tragedy? I'll speak to a survivor. In my big opinion, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. If she was a Conservative, she'd have been gone weeks ago. And in my take at 10, whatever happened to Hugh Edwards? And why are the BBC still paying him half a million pounds a year? I'll be revealing all. We're live at nine. Uh, so it's time for Social Sensations, the part of the show where we look at what's been going viral on social media this week. First up, we have a video where veteran Channel 4 presenter Matt Fry gets his words in a bit of a jumble when he's previewing what's to come on the show. Let's take a look. Channel 4 News. A former post office boss apologises at the inquiry into the Horizon scandal for appearing to celebrate the 2010 conviction of a pregnant so postmistress. And O.J. Simpson dies of cancer at the age of 76. The, the rock star... The, 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 <laughs> 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 Ouch. <laughs> We've all done it, have we? There's a, there's a little bit of bias uh, going on here. Whiff, whaff, whaff. Well, I mean, he, he should know better, shouldn't he? I've, I've done live TV, it's not easy, but I'm doing it better than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I love it when people do that and you think, oh, good, it's allowed. Yeah. Of all the things to accidentally slip up on, though, of all the topics. I, I mean, what happened? Did I, Was there a prank in the auto queue? I get the feeling, probably something in the ear, probably someone just went, he's not dead, or something like that. Just go, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm calling him a rock. Star. That Rockstar. was pretty special. <laughs> wow. Although I did see a tweet when all of the... There wasn't a tweet, it was all the push alerts on my phone. When it was announced that he's died, all the ping, 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 your phone goes off. And I can't remember which news source said it. I wish I could. Just said, like, football star dies. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there might have been another thing he yeah. was famous for? The, the football? I mean... <laughs> I saw that. I can't remember which one it was as well. Yeah, that yeah. missed the whole point. Perhaps they were big OJ fans. Yeah, he was the star of the film Naked Gun. And if you're not, <laughs> if you're not aware of that, then uh, you don't know the guy's backstory. It, no. Uh, uh, all you need to know is the glove didn't fit, Steve. Yes, well, that's true. <laughs> I've seen the pictures of that now. I mean, I remember it at the time, but now it looks like, no, it fits. <laughs> Do this with your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> you wore worn gloves before. I mean, you imagine. Oh. Turns out he had. Um, 
<laughs> next up, we get this incredible footage of a baby emperor penguin, some baby emperor penguins, more than one, uh, jumping off a 50-foot cliff in uh, Antarctica into the sea for the very first time. Let's take a look. I get the feeling there's less jumping off and more like, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> there's a lot of penguins behind me right now. Yeah. It was busy on the edge, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, did you did you know that emperor penguins did that? I didn't, but I've done that loads. Um, in <laughs> Cornwall, it's called tombstoning. You're not supposed to do it. If you jump off a pier, yeah. uh, it's very similar. Yeah, I love a bit of... I, I grew up in Portsmouth, and uh, that's the sort of thing that happens every year. There's always a story about... A sad story about, you know, a kid getting really hurt. <laughs> oh, no, that. we just had a good time and then an well, ice they, cream. They didn't notice that the kids had died down there, did they? Because they were just uh, running. The tide's got to be in. The but tide's got to be in. Did you notice none of them were wearing swimming trunks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, rude. I just like how impressive you've managed to make this very short section where we started off with the cutest little penguin video <laughs> and you're straight on to dead kids. It was record. <laughs> record. That's the subject, mate. Nought right. to dead kids in under three seconds. <laughs> That's why he gets the big money. Uh, and finally, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. However, that's not the case in this next clip where a goose doesn't approve of a passerby doing an impersonation of them. Let's take a look. He <laughs> 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 had a point, yeah? I mean, it was a bad impersonation. It wasn't even a I good I didn't goose. even realise it was an impersonation to start with. I don't know, stand up to a goose. Come on, I do... <laughs> I know people are scared of birds, yeah. but I think it's silly. It's like a swan and they can break your arm. <laughs> That's the law. That's I, what they say. What the law is they are, they are no, allowed to break your arm. That's all they can. No. A swan can, because the king owns them, they are allowed to break your arms and nothing you can do about it. I find that very hard to do. I think that's just pre-Google pub quiz rules, isn't it? Just say it with confidence, leave before the end, no-one knows. Yeah. How would you have dealt with it? Would you have decked the goose? Ah. Oh. I would like to say, because I've got, you know, some of my skills are pretty dangerous, Steve, and I don't want anyone to come and attack me, because I don't want to hurt anyone at the end of the day. Uh, I would have run like a small girl, a bit like the small girl at the end there, <laughs> dived under the car. Uh, it was funny. It it's is getting yeah. hurt, is the thing. <laughs> no! How have you done it again? <laughs> you start off with a cute video and you're straight into it. Unbelievable. Let's see what kind of advice you come up with now, then. Because uh, now is the part of the show where we talk through your unfiltered dilemmas. Our first dilemma is from Roger. Uh, I've started stealing olive oil. It's about £9 for a litre these days. What an absolute rip-off. I uh, don't have any regrets, but my son caught me. Uh, while we're out, how do I explain to him that stealing is bad, but also get across the complexities of inflation due to poor crop <laughs> yields <laughs> and a war in Ukraine so that I don't look bad? Cressida, how would you feel this way? Oh, how old's the kid? I mean, if he's 17, <laughs> maybe have a frank conversation, teach him some tasty life skills. If he's two, maybe just, I don't know, let it go. Tell him there's an olive oil fairy. <laughs> there's an olive oil fairy. Has anyone ever caught uh, your copious thefts? <laughs> um... No, I'm st uh, no, I don't think they have. It's interesting what kids do, though, don't they, when they see you wandering around the supermarket and ask you why you're, you know, putting the chocolate bars down your pants. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know... Your kids or dead, other people's kids? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking other kids' chocolate bars, Steve. <laughs> 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 I mean... <laughs> it's kids again. Uh, nine quid for a bottle of... Uh, was it olive oil? Olive oil, yeah. Class, the olive oil class. I buy isn't nine quid a bottle. You get a little, don't you? You get, yeah. the, you get a Alfred Slash from Cloud and Oil. <laughs> 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 no, go to little is actually the answer to a lot of life's problems. Can I just say I've also got a note in my ear saying this was Sainsbury's. It's not that middle class from someone who clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Sainsbury's is the most middle class. Is that Cal? <laughs> oh, we don't know who Cal is, but trust me, Cal is middle class. Yeah, it's not, not that middle class. Only Sainsbury's. What? <laughs> <laughs> if ever your earpiece says what at the end of a sentence, you know you're in trouble. That's what. <laughs> Uh, right, our next dilemma is from Rebecca, who says, uh, I'm turning the big 5-0 next month and I want to celebrate in style. I'm planning the party of all parties, but I've gone a little over budget, so I've asked my guest to pay £50 entrance fee. <laughs> This, well, I mean, that would buy a lot of olive oil, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, this will cover entertainment and a drink on arrival. My husband has found out and has gone mad. He's threatened to cancel the whole thing. Am I being unreasonable? What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is ridiculous. That's not a party, is it? 
Yeah. That's a yeah. nightclub. That's, a, that's an event. You, you, you basically organise an event and put it online and said it's 50 quid to get in. That is not a party. The yeah. idea of parties is you invite friends. Now, they could choose to bring things with them. Some people would, you know, prefer that if they did. No, I, I can't get on board with that. That just doesn't work. 50 quid as well. Yeah. I'm not going... You've got to be a blooming good friend of mine for me to spend 50 quid to come to your party. Yeah, you, were, you weren't invited to their one. <laughs> no. Calm down. Yeah. This, this, I don't even like this pressure of having to take a gift when you go to someone's house as well. It's, oh. it's a reason to stay at home. I don't even know why people celebrate their own birthdays, Steve. I'm very <laughs> miserable. I think the whole premise is bizarre. I mean, maybe a shared birthday. You know, if you've got somebody that's got one in the same week as you, that's a good way to hide, hide behind the, uh, the issue. Yeah. Uh, but no, 50 quid, if you try and convince your mates to come and see a film for a tenner, sometimes they don't want to go. So it's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, if I put all my mates in a room <laughs> and charge them 50 quid, I'd have £100. <laughs> <laughs> and most of them wouldn't pay. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> our next dilemma is uh, from Cathy, who sends this one. My colleague always offers to make me a cup of tea whilst I appreciate the gesture. It always tastes like dishwater. <laughs> I've tried to give her subtle hints, but she's getting worse at it. She always asks, why I never drink the tea that she makes me. How do I tell her without being rude? Cresta. Is this the double tea bag situation again? Has she got a tight friend who's hanging them out to dry? Oh, but it's no friend if they get first dips. <laughs> if they get virgin tea and they make double dipper tea. I can't imagine a scenario where I'd make you guys a cup of tea and you didn't drink it and I'd repeat that. That would be the end of it. I can't oh, imagine that's... a situation <laughs> where you made us a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? The, the, the patriarchy. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> where's, where's the tea, love? <laughs> where's the tea? <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. Why are you laughing? It's yeah, don't clip that. I've got to go. <laughs> that one yes, again. Um, Steve's last show. Are we missing the elephant she... in the room here that um, her, a... her friend hates friend her and makes, makes a tea out of dishwater? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that she's getting she's dropped hints and she's getting worse because this woman is deliberately making your tea out of dishwater because she hates you. Whatever the yes, is. there's yeah. often a lot of context missing with these dilemmas. There's a lot we don't know about the main characters. Yeah, yeah it could be beef. I could have could have stolen her yogurt from the shared fridge. Well, even worse, she's probably one of those people who charges fifty quid. For yeah, probably the same person. <laughs> I don't making you but dishwater you tea. Be, it, it, she should learn to be a little ruder. I think. I know. Yeah. I know. We put a lot of value into manners, uh, which is uh, ridiculous. And but th there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with being direct. Sometimes, is there? Like just. <laughs> It's like dishwater. <laughs> you get the point across there, don't you? Um, do it again. Let's try and crack this one. We've got a couple of seconds left. Our uh, next dilemma this week is from Ben. Help me. I forgot my anniversary last week. Now my girlfriend won't talk to me. She put so much in, uh, effort into surprising me with gifts and dinner at my favourite restaurant. I've tried to give her flowers, chocolates and gifts to apologise, but nothing is working. What can I do? You've been through this a few times, yeah? New girlfriend, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I investigate the emotions, ask her how she feels. Oh, um, all that. All that. <laughs> now look at what I look like. That, yeah, you're right. In comparison, <laughs> you're the emotional caring one. Beautiful stuff. Uh, well, thank you for joining us on Free Speech Nation. This was a week when the Royal Navy announced that new recruits don't have to swim or exist, uh, according to recruitment <laughs> figures. Senior Tories fear that Boris Johnson and Liz Truss will try to sabotage Sunak's election campaign. I think that's one area where he doesn't need any help at all. And the Afghanistan Tories board launched a new campaign. Sorry, that's meant to be, say, long-range long missiles. Wow, I didn't see that one in the script. Uh, Thank you to my panel, Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton. Hello. And to my guests, uh, were Joe Bartosz, uh, Lynn May, Stephen O'Grady and Romina Frohar, and Lawrence M. Krauss joined as well. Goodbye and thanks. <laughs>
Monday starts a bit chilly, but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning, leaving a drier day. There will be some sunshine around, but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland, and it will be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south, and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd... This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April.